My name is Scott Page, and this is my uh, milk crate. I, I pretty much don't go anywhere without it. What I'd like to do today, I mean, my slides work, is I want to talk, putting milk crate, talk about putting milk crates on the internet. So what I do, as Tom mentioned, is I'm director of the Center for the Study of Complex Systems at the University of Michigan. Now, Michigan is one of the only places that has a Center for the Study of Complex Systems, and it also has a minor in complex systems. So if this interests you after, class, you know, after this is over, you can come and register and get a minor in this. What we do in complex systems is this, as we think about how small things that consist of a whole bunch of differentiated parts, diverse parts, interact to produce things at the emergent level that are sort of functionally different. So I think of ant colonies, who sort of work as an, an entire superorganism. Or as Parag talked about earlier when he talked about the brain, right? We think of individual neurons are pretty simple things, right? They just have these sort of spikes and we heard their chatter, not a lot going on, right? But collectively, those neurons can do really amazing stuff, right? Personality, cognitious, consciousness, self-talk, all that sort of stuff, right? So what we do in complex systems is we're trying to understand how these things work. How do we get sort of amazing emergent functionalities from simple parts? So one of the things we look at is people. How is it that groups of people can do amazing things? And there's been a lot of work recently on this notion of what is called crowdsourcing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk through initially about sort of what crowdsourcing is and how it works. So let me give some examples. One example, um, fall of 2009, DARPA, which is part of the Defense Department of the US government, had a challenge. They hid 10 of these red weather balloons around the United States. They said, whoever finds them first, we're going to give them $40,000. So these things are put just pretty much in wide open sight right across the United States. One guy who had a lot of Twitter followers found seven of them in 45 minutes, right? Now, the winner ended up being this guy, Sandy Pentland, who's a friend of mine who's at MIT. What Sandy did is he said, if you find the balloon, I'll give you 2,000 bucks. If you find the person who finds the balloon, I'll give you 1,000 bucks. If you find the person who finds the person who finds the balloon, I'll give you 500 bucks. If you find the person who finds the person who finds the person who finds the balloon, 250 bucks, right, all the way down. In less than eight hours, they found all 10 balloons, okay? So DARPA got a lot of kudos for this, but then someone said, hey, by the way, where's bin Laden? <laughs> right? I mention that because there's a limit to how well this works, and I'm going to get to that. Now, this idea, as Paul Courant said beautifully, most ideas come not de novo, right? They don't come out of nowhere. They come from other ideas. And the idea of crowdsourcing came from something called distributed intelligence or distributed computation. So a lot of you have probably heard about this thing called SETI, where we're searching for extraterrestrials. You haven't found them either, right? But what you can do is you can use your computer. 250,000 people have done this. You can sort of say, hey, use my computer and go look for aliens, right? The difference between that and crowdsourcing is it's not the computers that are thinking, it's us. So what's a great example of crowdsourcing? There's this project called Folded, also funded by DARPA. So to develop new drugs, what we need is new molecules. And to understand molecules, we need to understand how proteins fold. So proteins start out like in these sort of single-strand DNA type things, and they fold up in ways to minimize energy. Now, it turns out because this is a three-dimensional spatial problem, it's really hard for computers. It turns out because it's a three-dimensional spatial problem, it's really easy for people, relatively speaking. So there's 59,000 people who, for fun, basically play these games where they fold proteins. And the best people at this are not PhD chemistry students, right? They're 14-year-olds, they're 15-year-olds. There's people who just have good spatial reasoning, right? Now, this idea of crowdsourcing has been taken into the business world. So here's sort of a great example. There's a company called Threadless, where what you do is people just design T-shirts, and then other crowds of people vote on T-shirts, and if your T-shirt's the best one, they produce it. Another example, there's a company called Gold Corp that had this mine, the Red Lake Mine in Canada. It's not producing very much gold. So what they realized is, look, hey, we own the mine. So they put all the information about the mine that looks sort of like this, and they said, if anybody can tell us where the gold is, we'll give you $500,000. Well, a whole bunch of people participated, and the value of this mine went from $100 million to $9 billion, right? So that's a lot of cash. Now, this idea of crowdsourcing has been turned into a business model by a company called InnoCentiv. So if you work in the pharmaceutical industry, you can post a problem, and they've got 200,000 people who are problem solvers, and they just go ahead and they solve it for you. Right? So you say, if you can find a chemical that does this, I'll give you $10,000. And then somebody will find it, and you just pay them the money. Now, if this seems too good to be true, it is. Right? Why is it too good to be true? Well, let's think about, think about the internet as a giant network. The reason you want to think about the internet as a giant network is because it is a giant network. Right? So think of it like a giant network. What's going on in a lot of these cases is you're just sort of trying to touch the person who knows the answer, right? That's true of the red balloons, right? It's because somebody's looking at a red balloon. You just want to touch that person. It's also true of an incentive. You just want to find that one woman who knows how to turn the blue liquid clear, right? So if you think even about something like Threadless, right? There's this problem, and you've got all these people designing shirts, but only one shirt is going to be picked. 
So there's a word for this, economists like to call it inefficient, right? It's totally inefficient. So if you wanted crowdsourcing to work, what you would need is you would need some just infinite source, some farm just producing kernels of knowledge, right? It was just being wasted. It was just sitting in some giant silo, right? Well, let's not call it corn. Let's call it maize, right? <laughs> so what is this infinite supply of knowledge? It's in my crate. Math 195, math for gods, right? It honors poetry, right? John Shy's amazing US history course. That's what's in my crate. How much is in everybody's crates? Well, let's just look at a, just a handful of R1 universities, 1.5 million undergrads. Now, one thing I do in my class, my students are probably cringing right now. Scott's going to say, let's do the math. Well, let's do the math. If you just quickly do the math, 1.5 million students, 12 hours a week, 30 weeks a year, 540 million hours per year of effort that just sort of is wasted in a way, right? How much is that? This isn't me. This is Clay Shirky, who's an internet guru. Clay basically said, how many hours went into Wikipedia? Well, the answer is 100 million hours. So that means if there's 540 million hours spent on homework, we do five Wikipedias worth of work every year at college campuses that ends up in milk crates. Now, if you think of homework, it's not just a matter of sort of you know, naming the state capitals or learning things from books. Right? So you can't just open up, click, look inside, and then go do brain surgery. Right? A lot of what we do in homework is practice. Right? It's sort of doing things over and over to get better at it. So if we think about these four ways that people do crowdsourcing, information search or searching for experts, those aren't really going to work for homework. But the other two, decomposition and collaboration, will. Right? If we can take big problems and break them down into smaller problems, or if we have people collaborative finding solutions, we can do it in the context of homework. So let me give a couple examples. So the first one is this. This is a, an example of open source programming. So what people are trying to do is they're trying to write computer code to find a really good solution to a problem. So each one of those blue dots is basically one computer program. And what the red line is that you see going down is showing that over time, the best program is getting faster and faster and faster. So each person, when they sort of turn in their quote unquote homework, their computer code, everybody else can see it. They can riff on it. They can mash it up. And they can make something better. So what you see at the end of this is some incredibly efficient code. Okay? Now, when I took my, I was a math sort of poetry person as an undergrad, and Seamus Heaney, the Nobel laureate, came and taught one of my classes for a while, and Seamus would have said, oh, Scotty, this is great, but the thing is, you know, what about poetry? You, know, you can't do poetry with this stuff. You can, right? So here's a graph of the number of poets in the world over time, right? And I put this up there because there's basically 6,000 practicing poets. So if I want to take something and understand how are poets collectively using something like pathetic fallacy, right? Thing is, I could farm that out. I could decompose the problem. I could assign each of those 6,000 poets to 6,000 undergrads, and they could do the analysis for me. So this is my crazy idea. I have this crate. It sits in my basement. It sat in my basement in Madison, Wisconsin. It sat in my basement in Chicago, Illinois. It sat in my basement in Pasadena, California. It sits in my basement now. I would like it to do something beautiful. And I hope yours would do something beautiful as well. Thank you.